to get yourself uh, into that uh, field. I want to rise all the way to 10 to the plus power of 20, uh, 24 down to 10 to the power of minus 16. So you have about 40 powers of 10 when you go down from the size of the hat pro uh, nucleon to the size of our universe. And we are living in the thing. So we are living in a thing. And when you consider the subject of astrophysics, But what I'm going to talk about is basically observations with the Hubble Space Telescope which covers the upper end from the thing and then there's a talk on nanotechnology which will go down to the smaller sizes later on. So let me uh, get to my talk. And at the end, if there is time, I'll show you a video on time similarly. But uh, let me start with uh, space which is what we are going to talk about. So the pictures that I'm going to show you now, the amazing pictures, are taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, which was launched more than 24 years ago in 1990, April 24th. And it's an orbiting telescope. It orbits about 300 miles above the Earth's surface and takes about 90 minutes to go one orbit. So you have about 15 orbits per day. You are looking at a telescope which is fairly expensive to run, it costs about a million dollars a day, so each orbit of time on the telescope costs about a hundred thousand dollars. So you are talking about something which is, oh, where, where is this coming up? Uh, okay, so after launch, it, uh, you can see the size of the uh, you can see the size of the telescope. It's about the size of a large bus, and it was launched with a shuttle around in 1990, and it was launched to an orbit. Uh, where people could go up and repair it and update the electronics on the telescope. So it's something which is uh, repairable. The next telescope that is going to be launched, which we call the James Webb Telescope, will be at a site which will not be serviceable. So you won't be able to go. We won't be able to go and repair it if anything goes wrong. And one thing lucky about the fact that this was in an orbit that it was serviceable was that when it was initially launched in 1990, there was a problem. The images didn't look very clear as they expected to be, but in 1993, there was a repair mission which went up and repaired the optics of this telescope, and after that, after the repair mission, uh, the optics was as good as they originally expected, and everything was back to normal. I actually joined the project uh, around 1992 before the repair mission and spent a lot of time trying to see whether I could actually get some useful science from the old images because we couldn't throw them, throw them away. And then when the new instrument was repaired, life became a lot easier. So this was taken during the repair mission where there, were, there is the sun in the background. Now the sun is very bright, so telescope can't get anywhere close to the sun. Uh, so you only see it there. And I will start with pictures of the planetary system, and then go on to more and more distant images. Now these are the planets of our solar system, Print, uh, sort of displayed not as we see it from Earth, but displayed relative to their actual size. The Earth is very small here, about the same size as Venus. Then you have Mercury which is much smaller, Mars, and then you have the large giant planets Jupiter, uh, we, uh, Saturn, and Uranus, and Neptune. Uh, Pluto is not here because it's no longer considered a planet, and it's what we call a dwarf planet. I will get to that later. So let's go through um, some pictures of the okay. Mercury. 
Mercury is also far too close to the sun, that Hubble cannot point anything to the sun. Mercury is far too close to the sun, that Hubble cannot point anything to the sun. Mercury is far too close to the sun, that Hubble cannot point anything to the sun. Mercury is far too close to the sun, that Hubble cannot point anything to the sun. Mercury is far too close to the sun, that Hubble cannot point anything to the sun. Mercury is far too close to the sun, that Hubble cannot point anything to the sun. Mercury is far too close to the sun, that Hubble cannot point anything to the sun. Mercury is far too close to the sun, that Hubble cannot point anything to the sun. Mercury is far too close to the sun, that Hubble cannot point anything to the sun. Mercury is far too close to the sun, that Hubble cannot point anything to the sun. Mercury is far too close to the sun, that Hubble cannot point anything to the sun. Mercury is far too close to the sun, that Hubble cannot point anything to the sun. Mercury is far too close to the sun, that Hubble cannot point anything to the sun. Mercury is far too Uh, from the thing, but this is the photograph of Venus taken with the Hubble. The Earth is not observed, but it's a nice photograph of Earth uh, with Sri Lanka center. Uh, uh, the Earth is seen here uh, at the time of the repair mission of the Hubble, where the telescope and the astronauts sort of observe uh, repairing the. The Hubble Space Telescope, and you see Italy below in the on the image of the the moon. It's sort of difficult really to observe the thing, but I put this photograph to show what a small and this is actually a combination of a few of these small regions of the moon that can be observed. The view of the Hubble Space Telescope, big camera, the one that has the, what they call the wide field. Can only observe about one tenth the diameter of the moon. The moon is 38 minutes across, which is half a degree, and the, uh, the, uh, the field of view of the telescope is about two uh, two arc minutes, two to three arc minutes across. So you see only about one tenth the uh, diameter of the moon. We are looking at very small regions of the moon. That's Mars. And Mars is a planet which has a lot of features. You see it at different times in different directions, as well as there's a lot of atmospheric effect, which allows, which makes Mars, even in the same direction, look quite different depending on the days that you look at it. Here is a time where it's pretty clear. You see a lot of detail in Mars. But here is a time where there was a large dust storm on Mars, and practically everything is obscured by the dust storm. So this photograph taken with the Hubble on June 26, and then another photograph taken on September 4th, where everything is obscured by the dust storm. So it's a, it's like a, every time you look at it, it just looks different to the previous time. Uh, another appearance of Mars during 2003's closest approach. This August 2003 approach is sort of put in the internet. You will get a message every August saying that Mars is as big as the Moon. That started with in 2003. It's absolute nonsense. It is not that big. Somebody took one line out of that message and it's going around every year in August. But this is actually a picture of it taken during that time. Mars, of course, is. I mean, we have actually landed on Mars and taken photographs, so we have quite much more resolution than Hubble can ever get of Mars. The next planet out is Jupiter, and Jupiter has one of the most interesting. Oops. Features, which is this large red spot, which you, which depends on, and it's very interesting. What the pioneering research on the large red spot was done from Trincomalee by a person of the name Molesworth, who did observations from Trincomalee, and I think still that is one of the few papers, astronomical papers that have ever been published in a, a print journal from Sri Lanka more than 100 years after that these observations were published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. These are photographs of the four moons of Jupiter taken with the Hubble. I have of course no clear views taken anything but if you want to monitor, I mean, you, there are spacecrafts that have been sent out there and photograph them at much higher resolution than that. But if you want to monitor constantly, those spacecrafts come there and then they move on. So you have photo, high resolution photographs for a short period. But if you want to monitor it, you have to do it from, uh, from Earth-based observations and from space you get a much better resolution. If you look through a small telescope, all these would be like point sources. You won't see any detail. Again, in Jupiter, you have aurora and the northern and things caused by the solar wind. 
similar to Aurora Australis and things which you can see from the Arctic regions of the Earth. You see the similar aurora on Jupiter as well, caused by the solar wind interacting with the gravitational uh, in magnetic field of uh, Jupiter. An interesting event, which is extremely rare, which happened in 1994, soon after the Hubble was launched, was a comet went and struck Jupiter. And then I was at uh, Johns Hopkins and it was quite a fascinating thing to look at these pictures. Uh, and after these pieces of the comet actually struck Jupiter, this is a photograph from the Hubble which showed all these marks which have been created by the pieces of the comet hitting on to Jupiter. And just to get you some perspective of how large those marks are, this is a photograph of Jupiter with the marks taken in ultraviolet, where I see the marks clearly. And on that scale, the Earth is about this size. So you can see that one of those marks covers the whole Earth. So if a comet like that was to hit the Earth, then we would be completely destroyed. There would be no more life on Earth. So, it is true, in a way, Jupiter is like a center sitting out there and safeguarding the Earth because large comets like this are attracted by Jupiter and Jupiter actually cleans up these comets and if Jupiter was not there to clean up these comets and sort of take them away and destroy them, we would have got more comets hit in the Earth. We, of course, God did get large comets, and that was not a comet, that was an asteroid which hit us, you know, 65 million years ago and killed off all the dinosaurs, but we could have that sort of event happening much more frequently if Jupiter was not there. Sir, so it's a comet, it's data before Yeah, it was torn apart by the Jupiter's gravitational attraction, and that's why you've got a whole string of stuff which sort of went and blast planet, so that when it got reacted with the, the interacted with the gravitation of field and Jupiter, it was disrupted and we, we knew that they were by a star which is about five times or larger than the sun, when it dies, it finally dies as a supernova. This particular supernova in the Crab Nebula, which is in Taurus, happened and we have, we know that it happened in 1054, uh, about a thousand, uh, thousand years ago, uh, because it has been recorded, the Chinese recorded that they suddenly saw this bright new star in the sky. And this is what we see a thousand years later when the that explosion and we are seeing the remnants of that explosion and there is a neutron star in the middle of it. These are various uh, remnants of supernova which are illuminated in the sky which has been photographed with the Hubble. Sort of uh, some very intricate clouds that you see. Quite, this is from the Pleiades, also the remnants of a supernova. And supernovas are stars that once they explode, if it is explodes in our galaxy, we will see them even as data, daylight. Uh, there has not been uh, observed supernova in our galaxy for the last 300 years. The last ones were Kepler observed two in the 16th century. We have been, not been lucky to see one. The only one that we have seen in, our, in the immediate past was in 1987 when there was a supernova in a galaxy, neighboring dwarf galaxy, the large Magellanic cloud. And this uh, supernova was photographed about five years later with the Hubble, and you see the sort of the rings of the gas that has been left over from the explosion. Other objects as we go out, now we are looking at our galaxy and we are going out, other of large objects in our galaxy are known as globular clusters. These are sort of accumulations of millions of stars which are together, they are much more concentrated together, it's like a cluster of things. And some of them are even older than our galaxy, so sort of objects which are going around our galaxy and there is about maybe 100 or 200 of them 
and these Gabbida clusters can be observed on the ground. If you observe them, you will normally see them like a blur. You won't see individual stars. But with the Hubble, you are sort of resolving individual stars of the globular cluster. You are looking at, you know, this is a very famous globular cluster in the southern hemisphere called Sponsor Takani, and you see the individual stars of different clouds. And in fact, all of our understanding of stellar evolution, how stars form and evolve, are from studying globular clusters because all the stars in a globular cluster can be assumed to have formed around the same time and depending on their mass, they will take a different length of time to evolve and uh, create things. So you have stars which are of uh, larger mass which have evolved now and become great giants and stars which are lower mass which have not. Another large globular cluster taken in the Hubble. Now, the nearest large galaxy to our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, we of course we can't photograph our own Milky Way galaxy because we are inside it, uh, is the Andromeda. Now, Andromeda is a pretty large galaxy, you can see it even to the naked eye in the night sky, but this is a long exposure. It's been so large that the Hubble when it photographs the Andromeda galaxy, it would only be photographing a very small region of the galaxy. In fact, it won't be able to photograph the, towards the center because it's too bright. But uh, if you take a small region like that of the galaxy in the outskirts of the galaxy, then you are resolving with the Hubble the, the read those parts of the Andromeda galaxy to individual stars. So you can actually do research on those individual stars which are in the, uh, around the Andromeda galaxy. And you also see the globular clusters like this which are orbiting the Andromeda galaxy. The Andromeda galaxy which is about 2 million light years from us is very similar to our galaxy and, in, and uh, we would be able to do a lot of research in our galaxy which sometimes is very difficult to interpret because you are looking from inside and do, being able to do that research with the Andromeda which is about 2 million light years away is very useful because you can uh, you are not looking from it from inside but you are looking at it from outside. These are photographs of individual objects uh, stars, globular clusters of the Andromeda, which have been taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. So now we are going on, going to larger times, and uh, this is a galaxy very similar to our own Milky Way galaxy, more distant one than Andromeda. A different orientation, so you see more of the spiral arms. The dark regions are the regions that I showed previously where stars are forming and the central galaxy and the sort of spiral arms which are not very well formed in that galaxy. You find, as I said before, there is these regions of dark, dark regions which are here seen as dark clouds and you see new stars forming in those regions. So this is a spiral galaxy where yeah, you're seeing new stars forming in the spiral arms and you're seeing a face-on view of that spiral galaxy. This is another galaxy, again a face-on view of a galaxy which has a companion galaxy which is interacting almost with it. And you can see the very clear spiral arms around this galaxy. Now in our galaxy, the Sun is on one of these spiral arms, the Orion arm, and is not close to the center of our galaxy. It is pretty uh, about two thirds of the way away from the center of our galaxy. Our own galaxy is a hundred thousand light years across. So you are looking at hundred thousand light years in the diameter of our galaxy. Then beyond that, when you go to the nearest gal large galaxy, which is Andromeda, you are talking about 2 million light years. So when we look at Andromeda and look at the light that is coming from Andromeda, which took 2 million years to come to us, 
the light left Andromeda before there was any humans on Earth. Right, a human civilization, uh, the earliest humans are around 200, 300,000 years ago. So you are talking about light that left Andromeda, which is the largest galaxy close to us before man was on Earth. Uh, this is the center of the galaxy at high resolution. Another one, Pinwheel Galaxy. This is space of galaxies are quite spectacular because you see a lot of structure which you don't see on, on a age of galaxy. Some galaxies are not necessarily a pure spiral right to the center. In this one, there is a prominent bar across the center. You have a bar and the spiral arms moving out of out of the bar, and that is a bar spiral galaxy. That's a much more pronounced bar galaxy, and even our Milky Way galaxy is now being interpreted to have a fairly small bar at the center of the galaxy. So these are all photographs taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Then the other view of galaxies is to look at it edge-on. And here is the sombrero galaxy, that's because it looks like a hat. Uh, where it's the same, uh, one of those spiral galaxies have been looked on edge on. And you see the dust layer in the regions as a straight line. It's like the picture of Saturn I showed. You look at it from face on, you see the rings. When you look at it edge on, it's, you see it like a dark line across. Sometimes, in a few rare occasions, the edge is not exactly a straight line, and you see here there is a fair amount of twist called, created by tidal distortions, and that is there. Then you have that. Then we come to the stage where galaxies which are close, close to each other start colliding with each other. Now, those are actually very spectacular. This is two phot a photograph of two galaxies colliding with each other. And in fact, we know that our galaxy, with the Milky Way galaxy, and the Andromeda galaxy are actually coming towards each other and at a velocity of 600 kilometers a second. So that is the speed of approach of the two galaxies, the Andromeda and us. It will take a lot of time to go to two million, two million light years, I think. It's about a billion years, right? Huh? Billion. Huh? A little more than one billion. Alright, a little more than one billion years, it will basically collide. Now, galaxies, when they merge, right, or they go through, they actually can go through each other without actually interacting because the distances between the stars are so much larger than the size of the individual stars that you could have two galaxies like that just going through each other. They would be influenced by the gravitation of each, of each other's gravitation, but they, they, very few of the stars will actually collide with each other. So these things make spectacular images and this is, for example, the Stevens, Cons Stevens Cons Cons uh, Quintet, where there are five galaxies sort of very close to each other, and these are the sort of galaxies at some later stage would be interacting with each other. Uh, we have already gone through one or two interactions in the process. This is another pair of galaxies which are seen to be interacting. Here you are seeing a face-on view of two grazing and encounters between two galaxies. This is uh, effect was probably after an encounter, these two galaxies are now moving apart, but because of the gravitational forces that were there, a lot of the stars have been pulled out of one galaxy, and this is sort of called the mice, because it looks like two small mice with their tails. And that interaction, this will be subsequent to that previous interaction. This is another galaxy which has gone through an encounter and a lot of, of, of stars have got pulled out of that galaxy into a long chain. So that we could get an extremely deep image of that direction. And once you photograph it was selected so that there were no bright stars to distort it, 
we've counted about 3,000 objects in this one field, which is one-tenth the diameter of the moon across. And can you knock this off, please? Uh, and then you find that each one of these little dots, right, is a galaxy. It's not a star. It's a galaxy with 100,000 stars in it. A uh, galaxy has about 100, sorry, 100 billion stars. A uh, galaxy has about 100 billion stars, and there are 100 billion galaxies in the universe. And here you are seeing, you know, about 3,000 of them in this one picture. And part of my sort of research, which I did, was to take pictures like this, detect all the stars, analyze it, try to get measurements of their diameter and their brightness and do some statistical analysis. There was another field which is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field which was done subsequently with the ACS. Telescope also here every one of these objects that you see here except for this one. Uh, which you can see the cross as caused by the telescope. The rest of them are all faint galaxies. That is also sort of individual ga galaxies that are observed in the Hubble Day field. Those images have about 4,000 pixels across. You can't when you display it at one, you don't see the details. And galaxies actually start as spiral galaxies. Uh, as sort of spiral galaxies and then they sort of uh, smaller galaxies and then finally they merge and form elliptical galaxies. Too big or too long to go into details of that. We have taken pictures of the Hubble thing and we have even discovered supernova like this one which is a comparing a photograph taken with the Whitbake in 1995 with a photograph taken in 2002 and in 2002 this particular galaxy had a supernova explode and you see this additional dot which is not seen here and that's in the Hubble Deep Field. These are the distant, also distant galaxies taken in the Hubble uh, and ACS. Okay. So these are all telescopes. You can go on the web. All these photographs you will find on a website called spacetelescope.org. There's a very large number of photographs. And I'll finally end with a small discussion about gravitational lenses. I wanted to do more, more of it, but I don't think I have the time. But gravitational lensing is something that was predicted by Einstein back in uh, 1918 with the special relativity. And what he showed was that light would be bent by gravity. So that when light passes a very large object, which is like a galaxy, that light would be bent and the galaxy would act like a lens. So this, all these, if you look at this picture, in addition to the cluster of galaxies, you see these faint arcs that you see all over this picture. And these arcs are not really arcs, but a distorted image of a star or a bright object which is behind this cluster of galaxies. And I will show this picture in more detail. All these little arcs are actually images of objects which are behind this cluster of galaxies. Another picture with a lot of arcs, some of them are red, you'll find corresponding images on either side. Uh, here you have also a lot of arcs. You can get a lot of detail about the gravitational field of the galaxy by studying the images. One of the, when gravitational things were sort of discovered, was predicted by Einstein, it was later on in 1938, Zwicky came out and said, Zwicky was an astronomer who came out and said that galaxies would have created these lenses. The lenses were actually found for the first time in 1978 using radio telescopes. And 
this was a lens which was also discovered at the center of a galaxy around 1982. When the Hubble, so what basically happens here is that there is a bright, our galaxy is here, there is a bright uh, object here, passes the galaxy here, or the cluster of galaxies here, then that would basically bend the light, like the light rays that are coming here would be bent towards us, and we, of course, project those direct light in the day. Uh, you are talking about very small distances, about one half second and you would see multiple images. It's like the same way that mirages are created in the, uh, in the desert. You see the light being re uh, reflected by uh, changes in the atmospheric thing and you find mirages. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Takaya. It was great. Uh, it's a brilliant uh, expose, and time is really the issue. <laughs> it's really the issue uh, because it's extraordinary. I can't believe what I what I just uh, mentioned, and I hope to have, have a very nice uh, moment with you and maybe some vacation to. Yeah, friends, friends, you know, with Tiso and the house. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but you, Michel, through you also. So I would like to give you this special appreciation. Thank you, and thank you very much. Thank you.